I'm uh, tasked with introducing our speaker today uh, on behalf of the Falling Project and the, the Wellness Project. So it's a combined initiative. Uh, uh, Chris Thompson uh, is a uh, kinesiologist at the University of San Francisco. Uh, he uh, has spent almost a decade uh, if you don't know what kinesiology is, it's basically the scientific study of body movement. And that's its relevance for falling and also for wellness. Um, he spent almost a decade studying, uh, specializing in the study of falling vulnerability among folks like you and me in our senior years. And he is a leading authority on this topic. Uh, he has in, been investigating what causes the vulnerabilities that we have to falling and uh, worked out ways of diagnosing where our greatest vulnerabilities are and then developing protocols for helping us to overcome those and minimize those vulnerabilities. Uh, so he's here today to talk about that research and other involvements that he'll have at Sequoia's. And with that, I'll turn the microphone over to Chris and welcome him. Thank you. Thanks much, Bob. Thank you for that introduction. Hello, everybody. Good morning. It is great to be here. And I need to thank a few people before we get started. Uh, definitely the Bobs, Bob Krieg <laughs> and Bob Scott, and also Julia Freeman. Uh, if, you're, if you're not already aware, these three residents are really working tirelessly to try to ensure that health and wellness programming here at the Sequoias is as top-notch as it can possibly be. So they have been alongside ever since I met with uh, Bob and Julia several months ago at a talk I did at a senior center, Aquatic Park, incidentally, which is uh, managed by the same organization that, of the Sequoias. And they have just been incredibly helpful in ensuring that things, talks like this and other initiatives we'll talk about today are actually going to be happening here. So this isn't one of those one-off presentations where I come and give a little talk and then I disappear and you never see me again. We're basically using this talk as a kickoff of a long-term initiative on active aging. And I have to give a lot of credit to uh, your executive director, Glenn Goddard, for really having a vision going forward, right? We're about to get to 2020. The vision for 2020 is really one of active aging here at the Sequoias, and it's directly from initiatives that he is supporting and helping to move forward. So this is kind of a kickoff of a lot of things that will be happening. We're aiming toward the opening of the new fitness facility here at the Sequoias, and that's going to be a really incredible step to continue to support all of the stuff we're going to be talking about today. So it's great to be here. I love talking to audiences of people who are interested in knowing how to get the most they can, given the fact that, hey, as we get older, things do happen, but we still want to engage in life and enjoy life as much as possible. So I put together a little presentation, and this presentation is meant to both provide us some background info and some actionable stuff. You're going to get a handout by the end of the day today. We're going to practice some home exercises. I tried to get Brad Pitt as my model. It didn't work. You're stuck with me. Okay, so you'll, everyone will end up getting a little home exercise pamphlet, and that will be intended to kind of keep you moving and doing things. Many of you already do stuff, but just adding maybe a couple more elements into your training program. So it's fantastic to be here. As Bob said, I am a faculty member of the Department of Kinesiology at the University of San Francisco. I have one of my students right over there, Lauren Ferguson, in her USF gear. She is looking good. She's going to be helping out with some of the demonstrations that we do today as well. So let's, let's jump into it. And really, these years that we're, uh, that we're in at this point in time are really meant to be the golden years, right? And the thought is, at this point in life, you want to be able to rely on your body to the best extent that you can to be able to get as much out of the later years of your life as possible. 
And we know, generally, that not everybody is going to be out there jogging or walking on a beach. There are a lot of physical ailments people might be dealing with. But even in the context of some issues a person might have, we can still try to prioritize having as physically vibrant of a life as possible, right? And it's interesting to note that even though older people make up the greatest population of folks going to uh, the hospitals and, and consuming the most healthcare costs, we also know that most older people don't necessarily feel like their life is miserable or that they're unhealthy. Over the last 20 years, AARP, how many of you are members of AARP? <laughs> I love asking that. Everyone's like, yeah, of course I am. Remember, the AARP does surveys about every 10 years on quality of life and determines what people feel as they get older about the quality of their life. 20 years ago, less than 30% of older people said that their health was good or excellent. 10 years ago, about 40 to 45% of people said that their quality of life was good or excellent. Now, two years ago, they ran that same survey, and we're up to about 60 to 70% of older adults who say, hey, my life is, um, my health and my well-being is good or excellent. So we're starting to notice that people are perceiving the way that they're going through the aging process a little bit differently, taking more ownership and being more empowered about their aging process, and thinking, you know what, I can still enjoy my life in whatever capacity I can if I take the steps that are going to help me be able to do it. So that's not to say that our bodies aren't changing. There is a researcher named Joe Signorelli. He's a guy like me, but he's on the East Coast. Okay, so we get Dr. Signorelli on the East Coast, Dr. Dr. Thompson on the West Coast, and we do a lot of studying of what it means to physiologically get older. And Dr. Signorelli came up with this concept of an aging curve. And really, ultimately, it just shows as we get older, we start to improve our physical capability in early life to adult life. We get stronger. We get better endurance. Our bones get more dense. During growth and development, we get a lot better with a lot of our physical capabilities. And then those capabilities sort of plateau during adult life, and then at some point as we get older, those physical capabilities begin to decline. And depending on how active a person is and what their lifestyle behaviors are, they either decline at a relatively slow rate, those would be people who are taking a lot of uh, ownership over their, their physical and, and, and uh, um, cognitive health and whatever the parameter of interest might be, or those variables can decrease a lot faster, those capabilities can decrease a lot faster. If somebody is sort of sedentary and doesn't do a lot and decides to just let, let time take its course. And there's always something bad that could happen down the road, right? Whether it's your cardiovascular endurance, maybe the bad thing is your cardiovascular endurance decreases, is perhaps there's a heart attack waiting for you down the line. Maybe it's bone mineral density, and there's a threshold below which you're likely to fracture a hip or a wrist if you have a fall. Maybe it's muscle strength, and below that disability threshold of muscle strength, a person isn't able to lift groceries or, or even get out of a chair, and they have a difficult time living an independent life. So whatever the issue is, and all of them interrelate to some degree, but they're not totally dependent on each other. Parts of our body are all sort of predisposed to slide downhill, and we need to do stuff to ensure that we keep those uh, elements in our body above this disability threshold so we can enjoy and engage in life as much as possible. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so... The way I like to perceive this, so it looks kind of, oh, we're gently and slowly, just almost imperceptibly aging and heading toward this time in our life where maybe things are going to be a bit more difficult. I actually show, and my belief is, that this aging process is really 
a series of unfortunate events. Bad stuff starts to happen to us and starts to accumulate essentially, you know, whether it's physical or emotional scar tissue that ends up resulting in more bad things occurring. So maybe early in life or midlife, a person has a, a tail, tear of their ACL, okay, one of the ligaments in the knee. And that causes a person to have a period of time where they're injured and their fitness or their, their overall health takes a big drop. Then they get a little bit better going through rehabilitation or doing some physical therapy or getting back to the gym themselves. And then something else bad happens. Maybe it's an infection, right? And then that infection knocks them down another tier. And then they get a little bit better, and then something bad happens, like a hip fracture. So it's just these events that seem to unfortunately keep kind of cycling through. The, who's, who's had a series of unfortunate events in their life? Yeah. It's no fun, right? And eventually you start thinking, well, when the heck is this bad luck going to stop? Well, the hope is, before we reach kind of the last step, which is no good, right? Because that last unfortunate event is your last event in life. Before this happens, we have to think about ways that we can successfully and reliably recover that capability to the point that, yeah, we might not be the person we were 20 years ago, but we're still able to vibrantly engage in life. So how do we stop this cyclical series of unfortunate events? And that's where what we do comes in. Ultimately, what we need to become is what I call a jack of all trades, right? Or what's the, what's the feminine version of a jack? A what? A jill. A jill. Oh, oh, I'm thinking of a deck of cards. Okay, a jill. A jack and jill of all trades. There we go. That's good. Laura, do you remember Jack and Jill, the Jack and Jill times as a kid? Okay, as a millennial or whatever she is, I don't even know if like they still tell nursery rhymes or you just see stuff on your iPad growing up. So it's good to know that Jack and Jill is still alive and well in the younger generations. That's great. <laughs> okay, so the goal would be to become a Jack or Jill of all trades. So the thought here is, again, there are a lot of things that can take us down. Maybe it's a lack of muscle strength that leads to the inability to be able to stand up effectively or carry things. Maybe it's a loss of bone mineral density that predisposes somebody to fracture. Maybe it's a loss of cardiovascular endurance, so you're just too exhausted to get out and enjoy life. Maybe it's a lack of balance that leads to falls. There are so many different things that we need to attend to as we get older that when we approach our exercise programming and our approach to being active, we need to recognize that we need to do a lot of different stuff. You can't just be a one-trick pony, right? Oh, well, I walk every day. Fantastic. I'm super happy that you walk every day. Walking every day for maybe 30 minutes, an hour, even longer, whatever your program is, that's going to help with your blood pressure. That's going to help maybe maintain good uh, cholesterol profile, but unfortunately that's not going to do a lot for your muscle strength. Unfortunately that's not going to do a lot for improving and maintaining balance and reducing your fall risk. So we need to make sure that we've got a bunch of stuff going on in our life to ensure that the likelihood of something bad happening is lessened and lessened. Now what does that mean? That means you're going to be active a lot, but it also means you got to be doing a lot of fun, different stuff. It's not boring. We don't want you to be bored when you're exercising. We want you to know that you're dabbling in a number of different activities, all of which are going to help you live the life that is kind of the best life you can live at this point in time. So Jack of all trades is also a fun way to approach your perspective toward being an active person because you're going to be engaging in a lot of different things. And we know that the exercise classes here have a lot of different options for you. The new fitness facility is going to provide a lot of different options for you. And ultimately, what we try to do, delivering you all individualized exercise programming, will help you make sure that you're doing a bunch of different things 
that are all going to help you live the life that you'd like to live. <coughs> Ultimately, that's not going to do it. One pound weights, what we call, we call shrink it and pink it, right? Instead of using a big weight, we're going to give you a little wimpy pink weight. It's probably not going to get the job done, right? Because really being able to engage and be successful in the life that we want to live, we actually need to work. We actually need to do some stuff. We need to be able to like push our bodies a little bit and feel ourselves gaining that vitality, that strength, that endurance, improving our balance. All of those things require a little bit of work and require us to actually work somewhat hard. It's okay. It's okay. With good guidance, we can do it. But I'm going to try to ensure that in the new fitness room, we have a little bit of pink, because pink's a nice color, but it's not going to be primarily pink. It's going to be primarily other stuff. Because ultimately, and I love this, Bob Priegel and I are in the same exact, Bob has written books about this for crying out loud, about what's called the flow channel, or you might hear it called the zone. And the thought is that in order for us to get better, to adapt, to improve function, <coughs> we need to match up our current level of capability with an appropriate level of challenge. Whether it's intellectual stimulation, right? Do you read comic books? No, you probably don't read comic books anymore. You read comic books maybe when you're a kid, when you're starting to learn kind of different words and <coughs> your, your, uh, your vocabulary hadn't fully developed yet. But now you're reading stuff like the New York Times. Um, you're reading stuff like, uh, let's see, maybe sci uh, Scientific America. You're reading interesting stuff. Or you're watching Fox News, one of the two. So it's one of the two. <laughs> um, but you're trying to match up your current level of intellectual capacity with information that's going to challenge you and help your brain stay vibrant. The same thing happens with exercise. We want to make sure that what we're delivering to all of you in terms of exercise options here at the Sequoias match your current level of skill with the correct level of challenge so we don't make a program so scary you become anxious or make a program so easy you get bored. That's the big issue. I'm just getting over a cold, so I may end up having a coughing fit or two. Can somebody get me a little water? Yeah. Just a little water would be great. <coughs> it's that last step of a cold, son of a gun, where you get the cough. Hopefully that's not part of my downward slide. Okay? <laughs> if, that's, if that's like step number, let's see, I've already had some bad things happen, so I'm getting nervous. <coughs> so ultimately we want to ensure that here at the Sequoias we offer an array of different options for all of you so that you can guarantee you are doing the right thing at the right time for where you are now. And if you can commit and feel empowered to improve your own health and well-being, then eventually your skill starts to improve, so the challenge of what you can do, and maybe the types of exercises you take on, the classes you go to, will actually respond as well. Very important. <coughs> okay, so what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time in focus on a particular topic. This is the topic that brought the Bobs um, and also Julia to meet with me originally. And this is this concept of fall risk and fall risk reduction. How many people here have had a fall? <coughs> How many people had a fracture with their fall? Okay, so a lot of people sort of dodged a bullet. Usually about a third of people put their hands up, but maybe only about 10% put their hand up when they asked if they actually had a fracture. And that's generally pretty consistent. We know that falls are one of the biggest issues out there. And it's become really my, my primary focus of study. Ever since I was a graduate student in 1993 at the University of Oklahoma. It's a long time ago. Were you born yet? No. Thanks a lot, Lauren. <coughs> you know, I bring students along just to make sure that, you know, knowing that when I typically present, um, the attendees in the audience might say, well, that guy, he's young. What does he know about this? So I bring along students just to make me 
feel a little depressed too and say, yeah, I was in grad school, were you alive? No, I wasn't alive. So I kind of am in the, in the same boat. But for many, many years, my whole interest has been on how to reduce fall risk. So I recently published a, a research article. Um, thank you so much. Oh, yeah. We'll double barrel that. Thanks. <laughs> we recently, back in February, published a study about our community-based fall prevention exercise program that we run at different senior centers here in San Francisco. Later this afternoon, Lauren's going to be down at Aquatic Park Senior Center running the class that this research is based on. I'll be down there too. I'm going to be watching you. You're on to you. I'm watching you all day today, Lauren. This is a big day for you. Your grade essentially depends on it. So just remember that. All right. <clears throat> because the problem is significant. This is my mom. This is my mom back in 2009. She fractured her wrist after she fell following Cirque du Soleil. We went to see Cirque du Soleil at Disney World down in Orlando, Florida. And my mom decided to try an audition to become one of the acrobats. And it led to a distal radius fracture. <coughs> Obviously, your wrist is not supposed to look like that. And the statistics really bear out how common this is. Right? Um, almost a third of people over the age of 65 fall every year. Well, we're up to about 45 million to 50 million people over the age of 65. So we're talking about tens of millions of people falling every year in the U.S. About 3 million of them end up going to emergency rooms to be treated. Some people should go to the doctor, but they don't. And they end up incompletely rehabilitating or having an, in an injury maybe a hairline fracture that never gets treated and the person has a lot of bad outcomes from that. Obviously super, super expensive from a direct medical cost standpoint. Fractures, almost half a million fractured bones annually. That's a humongous number as well. And the one that we really worry about is the hip. Right, 20% of people with hip fractures die within one year. Right, it's not because the hip somehow then stabs them in the heart. It's because that hip fracture leads to an acceleration of all sorts of other bad things happening because a person is rendered somewhat immobile for an extended period of time. Not a good situation. And even if you make it, most people will never really get back to where they were before. Again, it will be a big drop in function and maybe they'll get a little bit better, but they'll never quite make it back to where they were before. But as long as they can still engage in and enjoy life, it's a win. They've made it through the year, and they can actually then still engage and enjoy life. So we're not trying to work complete miracles, but having an individual feel empowered, given where they are now in life, to be able to enjoy it as much as possible is the goal. OK, so why is this such a huge issue? A woman back in 1986, Dr. Mary Tenetti from Yale, University started to count, okay? Fortunately, she's from Yale because she could count to the number 160, okay? I'm not sure if she were from Harvard. If I'm... I know Cornell, I'm a Cornellian. I know Cornellians. We would have probably come up with like a gigaplex of risks. But being at Yale, she came up with 160 different independent risk factors that lead to falls. The risks are all out there, they're everywhere. Right? We've got outdoor conditions and the weather, bad sidewalks. Within our homes, we may have some clutter or obstacles or just things that aren't necessarily appropriate to be in the room. You've got a nice throw rug. That throw rug gets rumpled up and a person trips. Bad lighting. A place like the Sequoias, we don't have to worry about a lack of adaptive devices because this facility was built with the older adult in mind. But there are a lot of people who are living still in a house that has not been retrofitted in any way, and they lived there since they were 40 years old. Well, 40 years old, they didn't need grab bars in the bathroom. 40 years ago, they didn't necessarily need excess lighting. They didn't need double banisters going up their steps. Things that really are appropriate as we get older. And then, of course, you know, it's still nice to look good, so maybe you've got some footwear that you like to use but, or wear, but if you're walking to the symphony and you're walking on these sidewalks, maybe heels aren't the best idea anymore or some other clothing or footwear that might not be the best. Then, of course, we've got stuff that happens inside the body 
There are a lot of medical conditions, or whether they're chronic or acute, that can make a person more likely to fall. Somebody has arthritic knees or hips, it changes the way they walk, and those changes lead to an increased risk and a less likelihood of being able to recover if somebody does trip. We've got impairments in our vision, our hearing, and our vestibular function, medication effects. How many of you are on at least one prescribed medication? <coughs> How many people are on at least one over-the-counter medication? Okay, so I'm going to count. Let's sum up, come up with the total number of regular over-the-counter and regular prescription medications that you take. So daily basis or whatever the typical dose is. Okay, how many of you have a sum of one or more medications? Two or more medications? Three or more medications? Four or more medications? Five or more medications? Six or more medications? We still have some people in the room who are on six or more medications. Now, it's not saying that medication is a bad thing, but we know that medications have effects and side effects on the body. They can interact with each other, or individually those medications can affect the body to increase a person's risk of falls. So medication, what we call polypharmacy, is an issue. Poor nutrition. If you're not getting enough calories to support body weight, I never, you know, occasionally somebody will come to me and they say, you know, Dr. Chris, I'm so excited. I've lost 20 pounds in the last six months. And it's, a, you know, maybe a kind of a really thin, frailish looking person. I think that's not a good thing. Losing weight when you're older, unless you're in some kind of a morbidly uh, overweight condition where a doctor is advising and ideally monitoring weight loss, Losing weight means losing muscle. Losing muscle means losing function. So we like to stay, at worst, weight stable as we get older. I love to hear someone say, I'm the same exact weight I was six months ago, and I feel great. So a focus on weight, which unfortunately our society does, isn't that great of a thing. We want to maintain body weight through being in caloric balance. We want good amounts of protein to support strong muscles. We need a vitamin D. We think vitamin D is just for bones. Vitamin D helps our muscles contract better. They actually turn on our muscles more effectively. So vitamin D is super important. Calcium for good bones. Nutrition is huge. And then obviously the things that I get all excited about, functional level. How stable are your joints? How mobile are your joints? How strong are you? How powerfully or quickly can you move? How well do you balance? How well is your posture and your gait looking? Those are really important things. Okay, so let's look at a scenario. We got Jim. How many of you guys know what Jim? <laughs> we probably all know what Jim. Here's Jim. He's 82 years old. Okay, happy guy. He's hypertensive, though, so he's on some antihypertensive blood pressure medication. He's diabetic, so maybe he has a little sensory loss on his feet, so he doesn't feel his, his feet as effectively. And, guys, we get BPH, benign prostate hypertrophy. That makes you have to go to the bathroom a lot at nighttime. So here's Jim. At nighttime, he needs to get from his bedroom to the bathroom. Let's say maybe three or four times a night because his BPH just says, hey, I gotta go, just the way it is. And then Jim's got himself a nice situation where this medication sort of makes him feel a little bit disoriented when he gets out of bed and tries walking. And then, uh, do you guys have, anybody have pets here? Are pets allowed? Yeah. Yeah. Good, all right. So there's a little scruffy, okay, a little scruffy leaves a bone out somewhere or a little toy. At some point, it might not be tonight, tomorrow night, this week, this month, this year, the combination of those different risk factors is going to lead to Jim having a fall. And in a bad situation, it could be a really bad fall. So they're out there. They're waiting for us, unfortunately. And the things that we use to reduce our fall risk get worse with age. Little things, our eyes, not big, our inner ear structure, our vestibular system, okay? Not big. And the little nerve endings on the bottom of our feet, 
not really big. So we get three little things that are trying to keep us balanced and counteract those 160 plus risk factors. Let's see how important they are. I'd like you to take a little bit of time to get up, make sure you're safe where you're standing. <coughs> And I'm just going to ask you to get into a position, a standing position, that might feel just mildly challenging. So maybe it's your feet together. You put your feet together and explore your feet together. If that feels mildly challenging, that's good. If not, maybe put one foot a little bit more in front of each other and touch the heel to the toe of the other foot. This puts us into a little bit more of a balance challenge stance. And let's just stand here for a moment. With your eyes open, boy, this is pretty easy. All right, want to make it not so easy? Close your eyes. Whoa, whoa boy, whoa. You feel that wobble, what we call postural sway? That tells you how important your vision is when we are trying to keep our balance. Okay, our vestibular system, our inner ear. Keep this position and now turn your head back and forth and mix up your inner ear a little bit. That inner ear that provides your sense of that, oh boy, hello, right? We're all feeling that little additional disorientation because one of our primary balance control mechanisms gets messed up. And just the fact that we're putting ourselves in a challenge stance creates less input and more challenged input from the nerve endings on the bottom of our feet. So it just shows us how important those three little sensory systems are and keeping us as simple as just standing up. We're not even really doing exercise, we're just standing. Okay, go ahead and sit back down for me. <coughs> so as these systems age, and you know the fact is, no matter how active we are, no matter how healthy we are, there are still certain things that are just destined to happen. We call that biological aging. And there are a few things that biologically happen as we go older, right? Hair turns gray, et cetera, et cetera. And some of these systems that help us with our balance end up getting a little bit worse with age, but a little bit unfortunately goes a long way when it comes to balance maintenance. Okay, so what the heck do we do about it? Okay, we're painting a bleak picture. Is anybody depressed right now? <laughs> this is depressing stuff, right? I mean, my God, Lori. Do I, am I this depressing at school? No. No. <laughs> Until I give out grades. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a bit about what we can do about these issues. And again, this is just specifically talking about falls. So if we're talking about developing better endurance, there might be another exercise strategy. If we're really talking about maximizing muscle strength, there might be a different strategy. So again, we'll have a diverse program here to allow you to dial in on the things that your body really needs to produce its most effective function. But for falls, which are pretty insidious and all over the place, we know that it only takes about two weeks of exercise <coughs> to start to substantially reduce your risk of having a fall. And to start feeling like, hey, I feel better balanced. I feel more stable. I feel stronger. So that's pretty good. That's a quick return, right? Your ROI, your return on investment, Two weeks, piece of cake, that's great. Typically, we've got to wait a long time to get a return on investment of a lot of different things. Lauren's parents are waiting for a return on investment, right, <laughs> for education. That takes four years plus. I mean, my gosh, they're just thinking, please graduate, please get a job, please don't move back home, please, 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 those sorts of things. So I'd say two weeks isn't too bad for a return on investment, okay? But we have to make sure that if we're working on balance training, we choose the right components for our training program. If I just say, okay, we're going to get better balance, we're all going to start a walking program. Research has shown us that cardiovascular exercise or walking doesn't do a lot to improve balance. Okay, if you make your gait better the way you walk, but most people aren't out there for their daily walk focusing on, oh, I must make sure 
that I'm lifting my feet and keeping my weight back. They're out walking. And whatever their walking pattern is, it's probably not necessarily focusing on getting better. They're just working on their endurance. So that's a good thing. We want that, but it doesn't help with followers. Yoga and Pilates, static stretching, these are things where the evidence has not pointed toward a reduction in fall risk. Okay? Where the evidence really does point toward a reduction of fall risk is getting more mobile, especially in our ankles and our hips. Why do you think our ankles and our hips are important joints to reduce fall risk? Stabilize. Stabilize. Exactly. Stabilize. We need to be able to stabilize ourselves and keep us, like, if you notice when you're standing, let's stand up, everybody, just for a moment. We call this postural sway. Okay, if your feet stay still and you just sort of rock a little forward, rock a little back, rock a little to the side, just a little bit, we're using the flexibility and strength in our ankles to help us stay balanced over our center of gravity, okay? So we use what we call an ankle strategy. Now, if we get a little bit more unbalanced, we can send our hips in a direction. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is a hip strategy to help us maintain our balance. So if we don't have mobile ankles and hips, we are not going to be able to use those joints to help us recover our balance. So instead of catching our balance like this, we may have to take some steps. We then have to resort to a stepping strategy. That's what happens when our ankle and our hip is overwhelmed. So we need good mobility and good strength in our joints to help us recover. When inevitably we lose our balance, there are 160 different things out there. So it's, I'm not saying you're never going to lose your balance again. It's going to happen. But if you've got ways to recover, it's really balanced recovery, then we're in better shape. Okay, good work. Sensory stimulation. Remember, those eyes, the head's turning, the eyes shifting, or the eyes are closed. Those systems can get better. They work, they integrate better together if we challenge them together. Muscle strength, muscle power. Having strong, particularly legs, strong legs help us stay more stable when we're doing activities, help us recover more effectively when we lose our balance. So we need to focus on muscle strength and also moving our muscles quickly, which is known as muscle power. Static and dynamic balance, the ability for us to recover our balance with movement or be able to produce movement while keeping balanced, right? How many of you have been told, work on your balance, stand on one leg? Have you ever been told that? Yeah, I hear that all the time. I have literally met with probably 2,000 older adults, like had actual interviews with them as they come on our programs in uh, the senior centers. Not one of them have ever, ever said, you know, I was standing there on one leg and all of a sudden I fell over. <laughs> I fell standing on one leg. Well, that's not the way we fall. We fall during movement. And if we're not moving with our lower body, usually we're doing something with our upper body that then causes us to fall. So we need to train balance with movement. We shouldn't just train balance by standing there. That's not very exciting. Remember fun programming? That's no fun. We want something that will make us feel like, whoa, I'm getting better. I'm doing something I couldn't do before. And then as we see here, June, June is going through a gate ladder. This was down at Presidio Gate Apartments down by uh, on Lombard Street, close to the Presidio. And June's going through a little gate ladder where she's practicing a different type of stepping. And we call that gate enhancement. So really focusing on improving the way that we walk and we step. Those are really, really important things for us to do. And then Tai Chi is something that combines a lot of those elements. So many Tai Chi programs have shown a reduction in, in falls as well. The important thing is we've got to ensure that we meet everybody as best we can at where they're at. Because we are very diverse. As we get older, 
our level of function becomes much more diverse. <coughs> if I told Laura and all of her classmates, go out and run a mile, they probably could all go out and run a mile. It would take them different time, but they could all go out and do it. Because there's much more consistency in expected function than people who are in their 20s than people who are in their 70s, 80s, etc. So what we need to make sure that we do is figure out where somebody is at and then give them a program that's more appropriate for them. So here, this is Harry down at Aquatic Park. He's practicing a stepping exercise, but he's tracing a finger along the wall because his <coughs> level of balance right now, it's safe for him to have a little bit of a balance check. Okay? Meanwhile, Judy and Virginia, they're walking through open space and they're shifting their eyes from side to side as they walk. Much more challenging exercise, but we determined that they could handle it based on an assessment that we did. So we want to make sure that everybody is getting the right type of exercise. And that's what we want to offer people here, okay? So we're gonna talk a little bit about, again, we discussed the flow channel a bit earlier. We're gonna talk about something that you're going to see a little bit of during your time here at the Sequoia. So one of the things that I do, I do a lot of fitness education with uh, trainers and clinicians, et cetera. So I present at conferences, do workshops. I just did a workshop in Sacramento this past weekend. If I sound a little tough now, I was having coughing fits. It was a disaster. I mean, it was really, really rough, but we survived somehow. So Mobility Matters is an online program meant for a trainer to deliver the most targeted, appropriate exercises for their older clients or their older patients. Okay? We call it precision fitness, an N of one approach, right? That sounds all super cool and stuff. The whole thing is we analyze how somebody moves, we look at them on a few different assessments, and then that gives us an idea of where their program should be at this point in time in terms of challenge and exercises. So what we're gonna be doing here, starting, we'll have a couple of, uh, Julia has them, a couple of clipboards with uh, sign-ups. If you are interested, we're actually going to have a couple of days here where we do about a 10 to 15 minute assessment with each resident who's interested. And if you want four homework videos that are specifically meant for you, sign up. Zero cost, right? This is just something that we're offering. We want you to feel empowered to be able to exercise appropriately where you are now, and it will follow the Mobility Matters exercise program design sequence. Basically, here it is. We do three different assessments. In a moment, I'm going to bring Lauren up, and I'm going to bring Bob up, and they're going to actually demonstrate these three assessments. These are the three assessments that we are going to do on residents who are interested, and that will give each person a targeted customized exercise program that they know is right for them right now. They can be doing, you can do up in your apartment, you can do in groups, or you can even supplement with other classes that you might be doing here and eventually in the new fitness room. So we're going to do a little test to see how we reach, we're going to do a little test to see how we walk, and we'll do a little test to see how we stand. And that quantifies the elements that we know are important with reducing fall risk. Balance, joint mobility, balance, gait, muscle strength, and power. All right. So, this is my father-in-law, Alex. He's doing the reach test. This will be what Bob is doing in just a moment. Help me! All right. And this is what Lauren's going to be delivering. Maybe grab the clipboard, Lauren, as your straight edge. That would be great. Bob, come on up here. Let's do the reach test. All right, Bob, we're going to make it happen. <laughs> Got to warm up, Bob, make it happen. Okay, so we can see, thank you, Bob, Lauren, Bob, Bob, Lauren, we'll bring you on over. And as we can see here, we have, I'm going to move this just slightly so Bob's not standing in the crosshairs of the projector. We've got a little bit of a tape measure here. We want to see the distance Bob can reach. That tells us how mobile and stable his joints are and also how well he balances during a reaching task. 
Lord, let's make it happen. Okay. <laughs> so what I'm going to have you do is scan hmm. recording. Is that the... Good. Toe, toe. Toe, toe, yeah. <clears throat> and I want you to be hip width apart. Here we go. I'm putting this over your shoulder. Okay. Go ahead. Hip width apart. And then uh, I'm going to have you reach your arm out. Good. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you're doing great. You're doing great. I'm going to make sure your shoulders are square. And then when you reach forward, I don't want you to go on your heels or lean forward. Just make a fist. Fist, good. We're taking an initial measurement point, 30 inches, and now? And then reach forward. Come toward my hand as far as you can. And we'll take a final measurement, 18 and a half inches. Bop, boop, bop. That's an 11 and a half inch reach. Way to go, Bob. Amazing. Amazing. That was amazing stuff. Okay, Bob, stay up here. Lauren, scoot over to the side a bit so you're not blinded by the light. All right, we could watch, you know, actually have videos, but we just watched Bob do it. I don't want Bob to see my father-in-law kick his butt, so we'll kind of go past, all right? But uh, he's, he's an old Ukrainian guy, so he takes calisthenics very seriously. Our second test that everybody will do who's interested quantifies how well you move. So how well you reach is going to be different than how well you're able to walk or move through open space. So we're going to do what's called the walk test. Okay, so Bob, come on over here. I'm going to put my cone down. Right on the mark. There we go. Please don't walk off the stage. That would be horrible. Oh, actually, this is my mark here. Okay, so the walk test. Come on over, Lauren. Tell Bob about the walk test. <laughs> you can hold it if you want. All right, Bob, I'm going to have you sit down first. Thank you. So I'm going to have you have your... Your feet are hip width apart. The palms of your hands are on the top of your thighs. Good. So what I'm going to have you do, you're going to stand up and walk around the cone as quickly as safely as possible. Then you're going to sit back down. Any questions? Quickly, quickly around the cone. <coughs> around it back and down. Yes. Any questions? Good. <laughs> don't walk off the stage. Yes, don't. <laughs> Ready, set, go. Good. 8.08 8 8 seconds. 8.08 seconds. Excellent job, Bob. That was fantastic. I mean, this guy is on fire today. It's amazing. Okay, and he's looking good, too. Pretty amazing. Okay, so here comes Alex again. He does the walk test. He does a great job with it. And then finally, we have what's called the stand test to look at the strength of the lower body. Another really critical element and helping to reduce fall risk. So the stand test is a 30 second test and I will let Lauren take Bob through the stand test. So you're gonna have your feet hip width, hip width apart again. You're gonna have your arms crossed across your chest and I want you, what I want you to do is you're gonna stand up and sit your tush just so it hits the uh, bottom of the chair and do as many um, up and downs as you can in 30 seconds. Ready, set, Go. One. Let's count out. Two. Two. Three. No, you four. missed one. Four. That's 15 repetitions. Way to go, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Bob. <laughs> All right. So simple. Three assessments. Piece of cake. Thank you, Bob. That was amazing. Lauren, B plus. B plus. <laughs> All right. Good job, team. Okay. I'll take that. So you can give that back to this bottle. Just give it to this bottle. Okay.
Okay, guys, so those are the three assessments that, and it's, it's simple, it's super easy. And if you can't do the assessment, maybe you're having some issues with standing out of a chair or whatever, those are things that we sort of account for, and that helps set us a baseline for where you really need to be starting your training program. So what we end up doing, and there goes Alex again, at the end he gives me a fist bump, which is kind of fun. Let's see him give me a fist bump. That's always my favorite part. Doink! There he goes. Oh, that was sweet. Father-in-laws are the best. Mother-in-laws, hey! No, I'm kidding. <laughs> totally kidding. Bad joke. I've got a bad sense of humor. Okay, so what we end up doing, you don't need to understand this chart, but for all of you, we will find out what your level of function is relative to a comparison group of about 750 other older adults. And depending on what you score on these three different assessments, it will determine kind of what the level of challenge will be with your exercise program. So, let's see, Bob, what was the length of reach? I think it was uh, 11 and a half inches. Above average, you're in the 61st to 80th percentile. Bam! Okay, you're timed up and go walking around the cones. 8.08, .08, was that right? Average, still good, Bob, average. And then chair standing did 15 repetitions above average. So <coughs> we're seeing Bob kind of fall in that uh, average to above average level. And that means we're going to give him, as his exercise program, a few different, more challenging exercises, level four and level three exercises. And these will be the sorts of videos that you get as part of your customized training program. Let's just watch two of them for fun and you will actually see what they're like. This is a level of ones. Oopsie. Oopsie daisy. I wanted to up my um, volume. volume, and instead I just switched right past it. That was a disaster. Okay, here we go. Volume goes up. Hello. This is a level one static balance exercise with a rotating upper body called narrow stance rotations. This is a really great exercise to start building some static balance capability. Static balance is simply the ability to keep yourself balanced with your feet not moving. Oftentimes we'll see it trained on a single leg or something that's very kind of non-moving and boring. That is an issue because oftentimes we lose our balance through an upper body motion when our lower body is staying still. So that's what we're going to challenge with this exercise. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We'll take a narrow stance. Your feet don't have we'll to practice be together, this in a minute. They will be together. But uh, here's I'm a going preview. to take a ball. You can use a can or even not use a weight. And I'm simply going to start rotating in each direction. Rotating each direction while maintaining your balance. You'll feel your weight shifting from foot to foot. And you'll also feel yourself almost feeling as though you need to activate your abdominal muscles and your gluteal muscles to be able to stay in this narrow base of support. Okay, so balance, the, these are the exact sorts of exercises you'll be getting as well for your four homework exercises. Again, Brad Pitt was not available, you're stuck with me. But these exercises are really provide you a little background as to why it's important to do the exercise and then you would actually follow along with me as we do a set of that particular exercise. So that's a level one balance exercise. Let's see what a level five would look like, same sort of thing. Don't get nervous. Unless you absolutely knock the functional reach test out of the park, you will not be doing this yet. Yet is the key, is the key point. Come on. Where is it? Please, let's go. Okay, well, I promise you, you won't be doing this. <laughs> Look at this guy. Okay, you might not be able to see it well. He looks like my father-in-law, but it's not. This is out in front of Aquatic Park Senior Center. I saw him one day. He is running on a log. Oh he literally is doing a log run. The log is rolling underneath his feet, and he's running on a log. When I saw this, I wish I had gotten my phone out quicker. Because he went through a whole routine. I was just like, my mouth was, oh. look at this guy. It must have been an acrobat or something. 
but this would be more of like a level 14 exercise. <laughs> we won't be getting to that anytime soon. But the goal would be to give you a really well-developed and appropriate exercise for you right now. So what I'd like us to do is take a little time to do a little bit of practice. We do have some handouts. I'm going to ask the Bobs to distribute some homework exercises. And these are meant to be, we'll fill in the gaps until we actually get to the dates where we do our full assessment. So we're going to work on figuring out what those dates are. If you're interested in coming through and doing the Mobility Matters assessment, by the end of class today, please come and fill out your name and your phone number, and we'll get you set up when uh, we get those planned, probably within the next month at the most. All right, we just need to check some stuff with Glenn and the rest of the crew. <coughs> but these homework exercises should work in the interim. And the question is, how often should I do these? Every day. The nice thing about balance training is that it really doesn't exhaust your body tremendously, so you don't need a lot of time to recover. If this were a ma massive strength training program, I'd say three times a week. But since right now your body, this is kind of easy exercises, every day. All right. So let's practice these exercises. The first one we're going to do together is called a seated hip step. It's good times. And again, what did I say about hips? Our hips need to be mobile. So we're going to sit forward in the chair a little bit. Sit as tall and as comfortable as you can. And let's start with the left leg. And we're simply going to step the leg out and step it back. Out and back. Three, four, five, Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen. You feel kind of the heat in that hip? Yeah. That's what we want to feel. We want to feel that hip warming up. That helps to help it make move further and activate the muscles that stabilize that hip. Right side. Step out and back. Two, three, four. Of course, these chairs have arms, so it's kind of tough to actually do the step. You're also stomping on the person next to you. You know, what can you do? Right? Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 15. Feeling the warmth in that hip joint, getting that hip joint moving maybe a little bit more than it typically does, that will result in stability and mobility at the hip. Important joint to work on. Then we're going to stand up. And again, so we don't smack somebody standing next to us, which would be bad. Because when we do an arm hug, whack! You'll end up whacking somebody. Stand sideways to your chair. That way when you're reaching and doing hugs, you're probably unlikely to smack someone. We're going to hug, open and hug, open and hug, videos please, open and hug, open and hug, open and hug. Very good. This is stretching through the chest and the back. We're helping to get better posture of the upper body. And it feels good. You can feel that blood flowing again. Let's do two more. And last one. Excellent job. I love it. Everyone can sit back down. Flip over to the second side. Our next exercise is a chair stand exercise. Lower body strength. Super important. <coughs> Bob, you get to take a break from this one since we made you do them earlier for 30 seconds. We're going to go through. The goal is, if you can't do this much yet, do as many as you can. If you need assistance using your hands on the chair, or even you might have a table in front of you that you push against to help you get up, whatever you need in order to get you comfortable 
in the sitting to standing process because generally we go from sitting to standing on average anywhere between 20 and 40 times a day. So we might as well practice it. Arms across the chest would be the toughest, okay? Hands on the lap or even hands in front of us pulling ourselves up using some external device, okay? Let's just go through one set of 15 reps. Well, let's do 10. <laughs> we're pressed for time. And we're going to go up and then come back down, touch the tush, and then come back up for two. And here's three and four and five and six and seven. If you need to take a break before you get to ten, that's fine. We're just going to practice. Here's nine. One more to go, people. Let's do it. And ten. Whew. Okay. Okay, so we've done two joint mobility exercises, one strength exercise. Let's do a balance exercise and a little stepping exercise. So balance exercise, let's come up to standing. It's our narrow stance rotations. Okay. Here we go. I'm going to use my cup. <coughs> All right. Narrow stance. And again, you want to find a position with your lower body that you know you can stay balanced, but it should feel a little challenging when we incorporate some movement. Again, if it's too easy, we're in the boredom zone or what Bob likes to call the drone zone, where you're just kind of not focusing at all. If it's too tough and you're all over the place, that's where things start to get a little bit scary, you get anxious. So, find that point where you feel just a little unsteady, hands together, and let's rotate from side to side. <laughs> and notice how much your weight is moving from one foot to the other. Now, if this is super easy, you can make it tougher by putting one foot directly in front of the other. This is called a more tandem stance or a staggered stance where the challenge is much more significant. And now switch your foot position. Other foot comes forward. And let's do about 15 more, rotating in each direction. Okay. This is approximating a rotating or reaching task that we might be doing, right? So the whole goal here is to get ourselves more confident, more stable, doing a task that we regularly might be doing. Fantastic. So that's another one of your, your short-term homework assignments before we start giving you your specific homework. Okay. And then finally, we're going to do what are called side steps. <laughs> Come back to standing. Ideally, if you're in your apartment, you're back at your place, you would actually do this across a pretty decent open space, right? You would actually step together, step together, step together, and step back. Either three or four steps to the side. Since we're crowded, we'll just step once to the right, once to the left. Right, once to the left. Once to the right, once to the left. Lifting up the feet high enough like we're stepping over a curb. Really getting more conscious of our gait. Side to side, side to side. Oh yeah, magic hands. There we go. I feel rhythm. <laughs> okay, there we go. Excellent job. So. Sidestepping, getting you comfortable moving in the sidewards direction could be really important if you get bumped into or something like that. So just gaining more gait strategies or balance strategies that will be helpful to you being able to, you know, get out there and be strong, capable, resilient. I love it. Those are all good things. Okay, fantastic. Somehow, probably because I sat on it. <laughs> I went in the wrong direction, sitting on my pointer, but that's okay. All right, so please do those exercises. Again, every day would be absolutely great if you can. So here is, again, this is a kickoff. 
This was meant to be something to provide you some information, hopefully let you know that there are good things coming down the road uh, here at the Sequoias. A lot of great things are already in action. You guys are very, very fortunate to have Glenn, such a great executive director who's really focused on this, and also have such great uh, residents who are really looking out for this stuff. I'm excited. So at some point soon, we don't have dates yet, we will have an assessment day or assessment days for people who want to get started on those targeted homework videos. Until then, you get this general stuff, but where really the magic really starts to happen is where you know that you are getting the right level of challenge of exercise. So you are in that flow channel. You are in the zone when you're challenging yourself. And we will send you four videos. Okay, so you'll get four. I'm not asking you to commit to an hour. Four videos. Take you about 10 minutes. Okay? 10 minutes where you know that you are doing every day something that is specific for you and going to be beneficial to you. Okay? Additionally, we'll be starting to engage in discussions with people on the Health Services Liaison Committee, the Family Council, the current fitness staff, the current therapy staff. We're going to be all discussing and working together to ensure that all of the current and future fitness and wellness activities here all are providing the array of activities that are going to ensure that they meet the needs for essentially every single person living here at the Sequoias. It's an integrated approach. We're all going to work together. We're all committed to ensuring that your activity program here is truly what we consider to be a model program. We want this to be something that other people look at and say, wow, I wish I lived there. That is awesome. Now that's not just the food. Trust me, I always make sure I stick around for lunch. <laughs> One moment. And then finally, we're going to work together to ensure that the design of the new fitness space, the usage plan of the new fitness space, again, that's under construction now. It will be coming out sometime early to mid-2020 that that fitness room is going to support all of these great activities and all of the great plans that we have. We want to ensure that, again, this is the best it can possibly be. We've got just so many different things coming together at one time, providing this window of opportunity. We're going to take as best advantage of it as we can. So the plan for the space, selection of equipment, the fact that there'll be good group fitness classes that are already taught by awesome instructors, Phil, etc., and even personal training opportunities are there, and you guys all feel like there is something for you here at the Sequoias for you to continue to get the most out of your uh, health and well-being and develop that to the best of its potential. <coughs> Unfortunately, I don't think the swimming pool of swimming pool is in the plans. I know. I w right. Right. Those are discussions that unfortunately will need to be a little bit long range, more down the road. This first step is going to be rehabilitating a, a fitness space that currently is small. Right, right. I understand. I understand the frustration. Unfortunately, there are a lot of time and, and, and space constraints that the staff has to work with. And at this point, a pool is not on the horizon, but I guarantee that we will have some small things, some things that will be appropriate for you that you can do without being in a pool that are going to help you maintain and improve your quality of life. I guarantee it. I promise you that. Can I say the PJ Saturday morning program includes all the exercises that we do today? I love it. That is fantastic. We're, we are not trying to recreate anything. We are not trying to tell anybody that's already here how to do stuff. This is truly a collaborative effort. The goal is to work and really, I mean, strongly work together and have discussions with staff that are already here, get a sense of what absolutely is happening here, what works well, which is probably almost everything, make small tweaks when it is appropriate and ensure 
that the new space that's being developed is being developed with the thoughts of a wholly integrated program going forward. Okay. Do we have time for questions, Bob? Yes, we do. Okay, how long do we have for questions? I'm happy to take questions. In terms of planning questions, I probably don't have those answers at this point because as I mentioned, this is our kickoff. But discussions will be happening over the next month to two months to ensure we've got a good roadmap going forward. Hi. The instructions that you've given and suggestions relate to people who have artificial hips. Um, can we do those exercises that you've recommended? Yes, these five I have exercises are... I have artificial hip. <laughs> these five exercises are definitively doable by people who have um, already undergone a hip replacement. The hip step, as long as your knee isn't going high above your pelvis, if I were asking you to bring your knee super, super high, that could potentially endanger the... Uh, the prosthesis, but by doing a step out and step return, that allows you to move that hip through a range of motion that's safe, but still effective. All the other exercises, absolutely. Those are fine with hip, knee, and um, met even people who have had back fusions, those, those all work. I would recommend that you always go through a range of motion, especially with the rotation exercise, that doesn't create substantial discomfort or pain. You're more feeling, the goal of this exercise is to feel the weight transferring and the challenge is to ensure you can still stay balanced. Okay. More questions? The sign up sheets are on the edge of the stage here and we'll also put sheets in the mail room. Yes, yes. question. <laughs> PJ has a class on Saturday morning. I know people who have those exercises. <laughs> okay. No, no, here. Uh, oh, at Aquatic Park? Yeah. And I wonder if it that would be possible for you why did they say that the pool? to do one of those exercises here. Okay. That is definitely something that's on the table. Um, we have to look and see what the calendar looks like for scheduling. Also, with a full time job at USF teaching. Yeah. Hip squeaks like like these kids here, but I will definitively do what I can to ensure that we have something that approximates our fall prevention programming. And again, very similar to a lot of things already going on, but maybe just the approach is a little bit different. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Does walking increase your leg strength? Walking doesn't do a lot to increase leg strength, to be honest. It maintains leg strength. But just walking itself is not going to increase muscle strength or muscle mass. What about biking? Biking, again, if you are adopting that as a new activity, it can be very beneficial. But if it's something you already do, what you'll be doing is maintaining, not increasing further. Stairs. Stairs. Stairs are fantastic. Now, of course, stairs, we have a safety issue and also potentially uh, an orthopedic issue if you've got arthritis, things like that. But stair climbing, cardiovascularly, and provides some strength work, extremely good. Chris? Right. Yes. Uh, I don't know whether you know this, but we were being videotaped while this was going on. I did. And uh, assuming the quality is okay, it will be available in the library. And if it turns out that you evangelize about this presentation, we could always have a separate session showing you on uh, showing the video. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, hey, this has been fantastic today. I really have enjoyed the opportunity. And again, I look forward to seeing you all going in the future. Thanks for your interest in this. We'll have a great, great time. Thank you all. Thank you. You're welcome.